Alexander, first of all, then, um, this uh, conflict is now, what, more than two and a half weeks old and shows s no sign of relenting. Why is that? What are we doing wrong? I don't know if it's so much right or wrong. You have to understand that Putin will stop at uh, nothing. And of course, it, in the world of idealism, we'd be working on a ceasefire agreement. But when the stated goal of Putin is basically to take over Ukraine and push back the frontiers of NATO and prevent Finland and Sweden from joining NATO, there's probably nothing that will stop him. I think we're doing all the right things. In other words, uh, an onslaught of sanctions that we've never, ever seen before. Uh, and on top of that, uh, supplying with uh, Ukraine with arms. Not much more we can do at this moment. Mm. Finland is there, you know, kind of on the on the front line, as it were, uh, you know, sharing a border with Russia, uh, as you say, politically involved as well in terms of um, ambitions, I guess, NATO ambitions. As Finland looks at this crisis, is there anything Finland should be learning? Well, I mean, you know, when you've had 1,340 kilometers of border with Russia throughout your history, I think you've picked up lessons over the years and uh, you know during the period of autonomy from 1809 to 1917 it was about doing as much as you can yourself after independence in 1917 uh, it was trying to avoid war and after the war it was again about staying independent and leaning westbound i think the lesson that we've learned post uh, cold war is that russia is not going to become a uh, normal liberal democracy and in terms of security uh, especially this regime and Putin will stop at nothing. So I think the lesson that we draw from this is that Finland should join NATO. Mm. Did you ever meet Putin in your time as prime minister? Yeah, I met him a few times, but I was usually the sidekick. In other words, I was a minister in a delegation with one of our presidents or a prime minister. So I've been in the room, so to speak. And, you know, he's, he's very analytical. He's very well prepared. Um, he's quite shrewd and, and cold. Uh, and very rational. Is there anything that you learned from being in the room that suggests that he has changed, that he is different now to perhaps when you encountered uh, him? No, I think the Western media is sort of going over the top and over the moon on this. There's a lot of sort of psychoanalysis from far away. But what the Western media doesn't understand is the psyche of a Russian leader. The psyche of a Russian leader is to promote uh, great Russia, historic Russia. And that, in his stated goal, is going back to the 1800s, which basically means taking over Belarus and Ukraine. And for him, great Russia, or making Russia great again, is about three things. One language, Russian, one religion, Orthodox, and one leader, him. He wants to prevent Ukraine being Europeanized. That is why he's doing what he's doing. From our perspective, it doesn't seem rational, but from his perspective, it is rational. Mm -hmm. And then, so, so, you know, we can under, we can, in that explanation, we can see the problem. How are you supposed to rationalize something that we think is irrational, whereas he's on the other side of that? Exactly. You know, never underestimate the capacity of Putin to act and a Russian leader as well. And the mm -hmm. system is very clear. And it's been that like that ever since the czars of, or the Romanovs. So you have one leader under that leader, you have um, so-called political or government support in terms of governors and, and others in your cabinet. And then under that, you have oligarchs who support you monetarily. Uh, and, you know, he has 80% of the population behind him. Part of it is, of course, state propaganda. But the other part is this sort of sentiment that uh, a lot of our Russian friends get from when they, they're small. In other words, that Russia is always isolated. Russia is always alone. You know, Russia has been attacked by the Mongols. Now Russia is being attacked by the West and NATO is a threat. So it's just, you know, all of these sort of assessments that it, it's, you know, he's irrational. It, it's, it's sort of wishful thinking mm. in the West. And we have to, you know, wake up and smell the coffee and, and see Putin for what he is. He is a totalitarian authorita authoritarian. How safe, realistically, would membership of NATO make Finland in that case, when Putin seems to really just call the West, call NATO's bluff on, on everything with, you know, threats of chemical weapons hanging in the air, war crimes already committed for, for everyone to see? Is NATO membership for Finland, is that, is that realistically going to make any, any difference in terms of security? Well, let's rewind first uh, and check the facts. In other words, NATO is a defense alliance which was originally created in 1949 
to uh, keep away a Soviet threat. It won the Cold War without firing one single shot. The Warsaw Pact was created to oppose NATO and it lost the Cold War. In the process, it also made awful attacks on, on Hungary in 1956 and Czechoslovakia, Prague in 1968. Now, what you have to do with Finnish NATO membership and you have to understand is you have to dissect it into short term and long term. In the short term, we try to get as many bilateral and trilateral guarantees about our security as we possibly can get. That means our president flying over to Washington DC. That means our president actually being in London um, as we uh, speak. And on top of that, of course, you know, we have a very strong and independent defense force, including over 60 F-18s, just bought another 64 F-35s, we are more NATO compatible than most NATO member states. We were always doing NATO training. We were involved in operations in Afghanistan. So, you know, I feel very secure in the short term. Now, in the long term, if we draw the conclusion that Europe has now been divided and that the security situation in Europe has radically changed, then I think the only long term solution is to seek uh, more guarantees and those more guarantees come from full NATO membership and article 5 which is about collective defense to what extent can we uh, at this at this stage then can NATO can the west can even russian neighbor russia's neighbors uh, sort of rein putin in I, I guess i'm guessing at what lengths is he going to go to here to achieve the ambitions that you set out earlier well you know i think it's it's important to look at the different options, but probably avoid speculating about what's going to happen. You know, uh, I consider myself fairly well acquainted with things Russian, and I got it wrong. I thought that he was going to do with Ukraine what he did with Georgia. In other words, create two frozen conflict, in that particular case, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, and what he did with Crimea, create the frozen conflict, the annexation and non-recognition of the international community. So I thought he'd stop at Luhansk and Dohan and Donetsk, but he didn't. Um, obviously his military escapades haven't exactly been successful. He thought he'd walk over uh, into Kiev uh, with roses and accolades in about 24 hours. And now I think we are into day 18 uh, of this war. So he's probably reassessing the situation. So on one hand, he's probably looking at, hmm, do we need to do some uh, discussions on a possible ceasefire agreement? And what does that entail? Those discussions have taken place four times. On the other hand, he's looking at his other military options. So allegedly seeking help from China. Uh, he's, he's changing some of his military equipment, which has been destroyed. So the modern stuff actually for old stuff. Uh, so we don't know what he's going to do next, but of course, you know, if I was uh, in a decision making position or if I was in the armed forces, I'd be doing different types of scenarios about conventional warfare, about chemical warfare, and then obviously about the nuclear option as well. Uh, hoping, of course, that the two latter will not take place. Just finally, then, Alexander, you know, you were not the only person who was who was wrong in the build up to this and the situation leading up to this. I wonder uh, if you look and indeed continue to look at the diplomatic efforts that were hopefully exhausted by other world leaders. And do you despair? Do we have diplomats that are able to handle situations like this in the West? Well, of course we do. And, you know, I'm, I'm also the chairman of Marti Ahtisaris CMI Peace Foundation. And he often says and has said many times that what human beings begin, they can also end. And there can be, of course, a diplomatic solution to this. That's how wars end at the end of the day. I just don't think we're there yet. I mean, if I were to, you know, make a wager, I'd say we might be in this for the long term. How long? I, I, I really don't know. Uh, but this is very different from the time when I mediated peace in Georgia in 2008, when we got a ceasefire agreement in five days, because then the stakes for Putin were much lower. Now they're extremely high. For him, pretty much they're existential. If he loses in, in Ukraine, he probably will lose his leadership as well. And he knows that. Alexander, I'm very grateful for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for speaking with me. My pleasure.